Please be seated. We are with Esau. Okay, Madam Prosecutor, you have those numbers for us, please. Yes, Your Honors. So the ERNs from the videos that were shown in the opening statement are as follows. For the France 24 reportage, it is car OTP to 0920996. For the Al Jazeera reportage, it is car OTP 2107-1169. For the video regarding the victims of Boali, it is CAR OTP 2108-0681. And for the report regarding Boda, it is CAR OTP 2066-5312. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move to uh, the statements of the defense, uh, the Chamber uh, wishes to clarify that with reference to the opening statements of the common legal representative of victims, that the prosecution in the DCC has not brought any charge of rape uh, allegedly committed by Mr. Mokom. This is to be clarified also for the public. There is not such charge in the uh, DCC. Now, we turn to uh, the defense and uh, we start with the uh, unsworn statement of uh, Mr. Mokum. Is yes, that what you asked for? Absolutely, Your Honor, but I, I wanted to thank you for clarifying this because I, I, I think it was important to mention it. And with that, Mr. Mokum can now start. Mr. Mr. Mokum, the floor is yours. Merci, Monsieur le Juge. <coughs> thank you, Your Honors. Mr. President, your honors, please allow me uh, to thank you for having given me the opportunity to address myself to you as well as uh, for the work that you have done to carry on this uh, process to this point. I would also like to salute all my Central African brothers and sisters. As you have seen in the publicity uh, boards in the country on the 22nd of August uh, 2024, you have to listen to Radio 24 as well as other uh, radio stations uh, to listen to the reality on the events of uh, on the crisis. The anti-Balaka movement was created following massive violation of the constitutional situation of the car as it happened in Ukraine recently. Then painful occurrences uh, happened, and everybody is aware of it. This was uh, related by international and local media. This established our inability to defend our own rights and to protect our own children to save the honor of our own spouses or wives, our mothers and sisters who were raped before our own eyes and uh, to protect, protect our parents from humiliation. We could no longer bear the pillaging, the burnings, uh, the beatings and everything no town, no village, no parties were spared by the atrocities perpetrated by the Seleka. We lost our dignity. We lost our honor. We 
lost our pride and we lost our sovereignty in the face of this armed attack. The political leaders stayed quiet and orders disappeared. The soldiers disappeared. Human rights were trampled upon and there was a widespread chaos. Uh, there was a vacuum in the area of justice. So this was, the country was transformed from a country of law to a jungle. So the people of the Central African Republic had to organize its own defense in order to ensure its survival in the face of the horrors perpetrated by the Seleka. The state of need created for the Central African people compelled them uh, to engage in acts of personal and collective uh, protection. Hence, the emergence of this organization called the Anti Balaka. Why would not the Central Africans take up arms uh, to fight against aggression, just like France did against Germany during the Second World War? During that entire period, I was not in the country. I was a refugee in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I returned on the 15th of February 2014 in the country to join the Antibalaka movement. I dedicated my return to the search for a peace rather than to engage in war. The anti-Balaka were demonized by certain people because of their political calculations and for the interests of other people. The facts were falsified and politicized on the 24th of March 2013, a Sunday, when a group of uh, soldiers or elements, the Seleka coalition made up of Chadians, Sudanese, Nigerians, invaded the car and occupied sub-prefectures, prefectures and others. On the 24th of March to September 2013, uh, there were 3,000 dead and many uh, people were unable to find the, the bodies of their relatives. More than 200,000 people became refugees into, in following, in neighboring countries. One million, 1 1.5 million were displaced internally. And if, as if that did not suffice, they started bringing out sick people from hospitals uh, and uh, shooting them like in 2013 at the CTR. They started uh, killing people at Eneka. They started uh, launching shells. And uh, during a worship session, there was an attack that everyone saw. They burnt down churches and murdered priests and pastors. There is a village of 1,700 people uh, near the road to Mbui, which has totally disappeared from the map. The village was known as Zaire. All the administrative buildings were destroyed. All the uh, police uh, posts were taken over by Seleka mercenaries. And in the face of this, the sons and daughters of the country rose as a single person to launch the anti-Balaka movement in September 2013.
Some of them died and some of them are still alive. It is not uh, this small person known as Mokom who was at the uh, origin of all that. They knew they had uh, fetishes and uh, traditional uh, weapons which they used to face rockets and modern weapons. And uh, thanks to traditional means, that is how people uh, went to Gobere which is a place uh, high up in the mountains from where people can see things. I am being accused today of crimes committed in Bangui and Bosangua from the 5th of December 2013 uh, to April 2014. And this is supposed to engage my responsibility as part of an effort to recover power. I absolutely refuse, I absolutely deny having participated in any plan that involved the crimes that have been charged. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for granting me the opportunity uh, to give you my point of view. I am convinced that you are going to assess uh, these accusations and allegations in this case, and I thank you for your commitment. I also thank my entire team in the defense for their effic effective work. Uh, uh, God, may God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mokum. Uh, Mr. Rochelle, now uh, the floor is yours. You have approximately nine minutes left. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Merci, Monsieur Juge. Je, J'essaie une phrase en Sango, puisque je sais... Thank you, Your Honor. I'll attempt something in Sango. People are listening to us in Bangui. Mbi Aralakwe. I greet you all, all of you who are listening to this case today. I greet you. I thank Mr. Mokum for the confidence he's bestowed on me. I thank my team for all the work they have done over the last months and the court for the work it has done so that we can have this hearing today. The trial of today uh, is in relation to the situation in the Central African Republic. Your Honours, nine years of investigations on the violence in the Central African Republic since 2012. What did the prosecutor fish out after nine years of investigations? Said, a prison warden of the Seleka, Bekatom and Gaisona for the Antibalaka are here being tried. And then there's a small fish, Maxim Mekom, Mukom, whose case you will decide at the end of this hearing if you decide to commit him to trial. This is quite little, Mr. President, I would think, because when you look at the images that the prosecutor has uh, portrayed, you can notice the intensity and the scope of the violence that happened in that country during the period under review. But where are the brains behind the Seleka plan? They, they had weapons, true weapons. They had military uniforms. They had everything, and there were crimes that could be linked to individuals, to officers, and to some leaders, as the case might be. This is a strange type of justice, wherein, after all these years, this is what is happening to the Antibalaka. Why is it that the infamous Angelo Antibalaka is in prison today, whereas another equally infamous Antibalaka, Thierry Libene, is a militia leader on behalf of President Theodora. Um, and there are also many uh, Antibalakas who several times over have been identified in Bangui but have been treated differently. Why is Yekatom in prison while Captain Kamizolai and 
Sebastien Wenezui and Leopold Barra and others who spoke on behalf of the anti-Balaka after they had captured Bangui, they spoke proudly thanking them for having saved Bangui, and yet they are still free. Why is Ngaisona in prison? And why is Kokate a prosecution witness against him, whereas both were also involved in the setting up of the coordinations which attempted to deal with the anti-Balaka after Bangui fell on the 5th of December 2013? Why, we must ask, is Mokram here before you? And Ndomate, Winizwe, both ministers who held important ministerial positions in the transitional government and who were at the very heart of the events in 2013. Why are they not here? What are Baya, Angaya, and Demafut doing today? Whereas these are the persons who rushed to Bangui in order to take advantage of the fall of the Seleka. According to the evidence, Bara, Bara did not represent the Balaka. He is the one who went to Jamena to negotiate for the fall of uh, Jotodia. And he was sent by a minister uh, who was Jotodia's minister, by the way. Why is Mokom here? Who is accusing Mokom? We can't say. We cannot say. It's a mystery. It's a secret. It's a bit of an open secret. Not a secret. Because we at least have an idea. You see, Demafut testified in open court. Kokate testified in open court. These are the people who benefited from the anti-Balaka movement and who did not hesitate to hail the movement in 2012. But today, for opportunistic reasons, or reasons best known to them, have appeared before this court to demonize the anti-Balaka movement. These are the people whom we have heard who have been heard, as well as others who have not been heard, and whom you know, and whom we know, who have made it possible for the prosecutor today to rise in this court and to assert without blinking that it is the anti-Balaka, those anti-Balaka, some of whom went barefooted from their villages to Bangui, those anti-Balaka who got there without food and only had their fetishes, fetishes and so on and so forth, that they would have been involved in a criminal plan. Tomorrow, during the three hours that I have, I will demonstrate to you that these criminals only exist in the figment of the prosecutor's mind. They have tried in vain to uh, in, to influence the minds of some witnesses, but I want to reassure you that, and I will show you that some know where the truth lies. I will point to exculpatory evidence and indicate to the court that a realistic and objective analysis of the evidence before the court does not make it possible to substantiate any such accusations against my client. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Counsel. So uh, we are done now with the uh, opening statements. Uh, we will then uh, start with the submissions uh, on the merits. Uh, the prosecution uh, will start, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Your Honor. We will again require access to evidence channel two.
All right, we experienced a technical issue uh, about uh, 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 the system, so we will uh, take a break. Hopefully, we will uh, start again in, in 10 minutes or as soon as possible. Thank you very much and see you soon. All right, <coughs> we will be. All right, we will be. Please be seated, we will be as well. Thank you very much for waiting. Now uh, the prosecution, the floor is yours. The countdown starts as of now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Honours. Mr. President, Your Honors, I will set out the prosecution's case against Mr. Mokram in the following 120 minutes. You have received our written submissions, and I will focus only on the key aspects of our evidence today. The prosecution will show that there are substantial grounds to believe that Mr. Mokram was an accessory to the crimes as charged, and therefore, that he should be committed to trial. My presentation will focus on the evidence supporting the charged war crimes and crimes against humanity, and then I will focus on Mr. Mokram's individual criminal responsibility. As you have heard earlier today, from the deputy prosecutor in his opening. The five December attacks on Bangui and Bosangoa did not take place in a vacuum. Rather, they fit a pattern of crimes against Muslim civilians that was reported by national and international media and raised concern in the international community. A pattern that started in September 2013 and continued for months after the attacks, which I will now discuss in detail. I will start with the charged crimes related to Bangui. In the early morning hours of 5th December 2013, around 1,500 anti balaka elements mounted a coordinated attack on Bangui. 
these elements were organized in several groups and were led by inter alia the following persons. Ivan Conate, Rodrigue Engaibona, Thierry Lebene, Alfred Rombot Yekatom, and Charles Angramangu. Yekatom and Angramangu based themselves in Boeing together with one Silvestre Yaguzu, who would later become Mr. Mokom's deputy. Lebene, Konate, and Engaibona, together with their elements, had moved from different directions in the weeks before to join forces at the outskirts of Bangui. One of those who encouraged them to attack the city and was involved in coordinating their efforts was Maxime Mokom. Mr. Mokom is charged with aiding and abetting as well as otherwise contributing to the crimes of those anti-Balaka groups in Bangui on 5 December and the months afterwards until at least end of April 2014. Witnesses such as P1521, P2269, P0446, and P0884 describe how the attack unfolded in detail, and your honors have their accounts on the list of evidence. The anti balaka groups targeted the Seleka in Bangui at Camp Kasai, Camp de Rue, Camp de Sapeur de Pompier, Assemblée Nationale, and the Centre Protestant pour la Jeunesse. P0889 and P2232 state that Mr. Mokram contributed to this coordination of the attack by pushing the elements from the bush to Bangui. He was also involved in devising the strategy for the attack. I will get back to this later. This attack was initially not successful. Anti-Balaka groups retreated around Bangui and then regrouped to continue to attack in the following weeks until they had achieved Jatadia's resignation and the takeover of Bangui. Once the Seleka regime had been ousted, some of the former leaders of the attack became so-called comzones which means zone commander, and the national coordination of the anti-Balaka was formalized. Mr. Mokom was then designated operations coordinator, which is also reflected in documentation you will see today. The prosecution's evidence establishes substantial grounds to believe that the charged crimes were committed in Bangui by anti-Balaka elements in the course of the attack, subsequent attacks until at least end of April 2014. Following the pattern of conduct we have seen in the prosecution's opening, the anti-Balaka turned against Muslim civilians. I will first address counts two and three, attacks against buildings dedicated to religion. The anti-Balaka who descended on Bangui targeted religious buildings of the Muslim community, including mosques and prayer rooms. For count two and three, the prosecution relies on the findings of the Commission of Inquiry, witness statements, as well as imagery of destruction. The evidence shows that Anti Balaka intentionally destroyed several mosques in the relevant time frame. Your Honors, to go into this issue, I would like to request a brief private session because I would like to reflect on what one witness says who would be identified. Mr. Court Officer.
We're back in open session, Mr. President. Please proceed. Thank you. Your Honor, satellite imagery shows the destruction, for instance, of the Boeing mosque. The big map on your screens <laughs> indicates the location of the mosque in Bangui, and the inset squares contain zoomed pictures of the mosque area taken on different days. In these pictures, we can see that the mosque, which is the bigger building marked by the yellow circle, was intact on 27th November, but that its roof is missing by 8th December 2013. The pictures also show that not only the mosque, but also some adjacent buildings were destroyed. P2125 witnessed the anti-Balaka destroying this mosque. He recalls that they urinated <coughs> on the Holy Quran pillaged the building by removing carpets, roofs, doors, and even its walls. The witness also heard the anti balaka saying that they did not want to see Muslims there anymore. Witness P1339 recalls that one of the anti balaka leaders who took part in the 5 December attack ordered to destroy Muslim houses and mosques including this mosque. Based on the Commission of Inquiry's final report, at least 43 mosques were completely destroyed in the aftermath of the attack. The Commission of Inquiry visited the mosques of Fu, Boirab, Miskin, Malimaka, and Engaragba, and could, could, could confirm that there was nothing left. The only mosques which were still intact were the few located near PK-5. None of the damaged or destroyed mosques constituted a legitimate military objective, nor was their destruction justified by military necessity. Regarding counts three and four, destruction of private properties and pillage of houses and shops, your Honours, during the attack and its aftermath, the anti-Balaka also intentionally destroyed houses in predominantly Muslim neighborhoods of Bangui, such as Fu, Miskin, Combatan, Kina, Sara, PK-5, Kokoro, Buka, PK-12, and PK-13. In a report, of which your honors can see an excerpt on the screens right now, UNOSAT assessed that 325 structures in the third arrondissement, which includes PK-5 and Kokoro, were destroyed. Between 22nd February 2014 and 6 June 2014, an additional 469 had been destroyed in the third arrondissement. Again, according to the Commission of Inquiry report, over 1,300 buildings had been destroyed, most being located in the 3rd, 5th, and 8th arrondissement in Bangui, where the majority of the city's Muslims lived. Like for the mosques, the houses of Muslims were not destroyed by chance. P1339 and others recalled that they were ordered to destroy houses. As an example, your honors, witness P0434 recalls the pillaging and destruction of his properties by anti Balaka on 22nd January 2014. In one video that the witness provided, we can see the extent of the damage. As the video is without sound and only an excerpt, it can be viewed publicly. P0434, devoid of property like so many Muslims of Bangui, 
fled to Cameroon in early 2014. For counts two to four, there is evidence that Bangui civilians also took part in some of these destructions. Even though all destructions may not have been committed by anti-Balaka only, testimonial and documentary evidence corroborate that the anti-Balaka, with their manpower and organization, played a key role in it. They had taken control of Bangui at the latest after Jatodia's resignation. Concerning counts five to six, your honors have just seen the destruction of the property of P0434, but the suffering of his family did not end there. After the properties were destroyed, he and his family sought refuge and fled to Cameroon in February 2014. His extended family took refuge in PK5, as this at the same time was the safest place for Muslims. The witness's extended family was then escorted from PK5 to Bangui Airport, from where, like so many others, the International Organization for Migration evacuated them. Similarly, witness P1452 explains that as the anti-Balaka continued to attack PK-5, he also had to evacuate his family to Chad. This was in January 2014. He himself later also had to leave Carr after his businesses had been destroyed by anti-Balaka. Like P-1452, P-1676, describes the decision to leave PK-5 with, uh, with his family and out of fear of the anti-Muslim violence at the time. The prosecution has interviewed more witnesses who describe that from 5th December onwards, the anti-Balaka acts directed at civilians left thousands of Muslim civilians with no choice but to leave their homes and flee to other parts of Kar or to neighboring countries such as Cameroon or Chad. Witness P2328, who had a good overview of the situation at the time, and I quote him in French, Entre janvier Between January and March 2014, the entire Muslim population of uh, Bangui became afraid the Muslims therefore decided uh, to leave the town faced with the harassment of the anti-Balaka. We're vocal about these intentions. For instance, they told Human Rights Watch that they would kill Muslims remaining in the neighborhoods of PK-12, PK-13, Miss Keen, and PK-5. I'm referring here to R O T P 2001-2237. In this video, which I would like to play for you now, you can see hundreds of Muslims who stayed at the airport of Bangui in the hope of being evacuated to Chad, thus transforming the airport also into a refugee camp. This video is in English. Hundreds of Muslims are here, sheltering for now amidst what remains of the National Air Force. This Imam told me his mosque was burnt down, his parents murdered, everything stolen, all by the Christian militia, the anti-Balaka. Tens of thousands more fled on road convoys. P2698 described how by around the 20th December 2013, the majority of Muslims in PK-5 had fled in a number of large vehicles brought in from Chad and taken to Cameroon or Chad. On your screen, your honors, you can see photos of remaining Muslims sheltering at the PK-5 mosque and of a convoy <laughs> leaving on 14th January 2014 from PK-5. 
On the next slide, images of Muslim civilians having to flee Bangui on 1st of April are captured. P1577 recounts that end of January 2014, he came across the only Muslim family left in an area around PK13, PK14. This family had to be accompanied by French forces to an enclave to save them from anti Balaka, who had threatened to kill them. This witness also saw the evacuations by the convoys. He said, the Muslims had no choice but to leave. Reports by organizations such as the Commission of Inquiry and Médecins Sans Frontières, for example, indicate that approximately 99% of the city's Muslim population had to flee by March 2014 and that 80% of the entire country's Muslim population fled to Cameroon or Chad, Chad in this period. Bangui had been emptied of its Muslim population by at least in large part the actions of the anti-Balaka. Regarding count seven, those civilians who fled due to the anti-Balaka attacks against them but were not able to reach a neighboring country, were trapped in PK-5, around the central mosque area. They were thus deprived of their liberty. This is confirmed by witnesses P-1339 and P-2328, for instance. Specifically, Muslim civilians were unable to leave this area due to the constant and conspicuous threat of violence by the anti-Balaka if they tried to do so. P1339, for example, stated that after the attack on 5 December, Muslims from Boeing all fled to PK-5 to the central mosque. Another witness described how on 5th December he and 11 other family members quickly left their home in a neighborhood in Bangui and also fled for their lives to PK-5. P2328 states that in the aftermath of the December attack, Muslims from all over Bangui had to seek refuge around the central mosque because the anti-Balaka had started to go after the Muslim population. He describes how anti-Balaka were harassing the Muslims in PK-5, outside of PK-5 enclave, by shooting their weapons. Another witness, P2472, stated that the enclave was encircled by anti-Balaka so that Muslims could not leave. He also described how bodies were regularly brought to the Ali Babolo Mosque and that many Muslims in PK-5 saw those bodies who were killed in a brutal manner. Being encircled like this and seeing these dead bodies worked as a threat and confi confined the Muslim civilians to the enclave. There, they had to endure a lack of adequate food, shelter, and sanitation. Contemporaneous NGO reports, information gathered by the Commission of Inquiry, as well as journalists and victims, describe the humanitarian condition in the enclave. I refer you, for example, to the statement of witness P1865, which is at CAR OTP 2066-0134 at paragraph 47. The Commission of Inquiry also reported that because of the siege on this enclave, the Muslims holed up there suffered from lack of food and medicine and could not find burying ground or cemeteries for their dead in that time. On your screen, you see an example of how Muslims lived in this enclave at the relevant time. 
In this way, the anti-Balaka severely deprived thousands of Muslims in Bangui, in the PK-5 enclave, of their physical liberty, in violation of fundamental rules of international law, and in the aftermath of the 5 December attack. This is charged under count seven. Your Honors, the criminal acts in relation to Bangui that I've just described were committed by anti-Balaka elements in Bangui. They also form part of the underlying acts of persecution, which is charged as count eight. The anti-Balaka targeted the Muslim civilian population because, based on their religious, political, national, or ethnic affiliation, they perceived them as collectively responsible or complicit with, supportive of the Seleka. The anti-Balaka therefore carried out the crimes I just described with the intent to discriminate on multiple prohibited grounds. The persecutory intent to car target the Muslim population coexisted alongside the anti-Balaka's desire to regain power and the desire for revenge the two were closely associated. The pattern I've described shows that the victims were targeted based on their actual or perceived Muslim religion. The perpetrators attacked their places of worship like mosques and prayer rooms. The fact that the victims were perceived as politically affiliated to and supportive of Seleka shows also that the victims were targeted on political grounds. We will get further into the statements provided by insider witnesses and public statements of anti-Balaka elements and high-ranking anti-Balaka in Marcom's responsibility section. But at this point, I would already like to refer you to the evidence of P2625 at CAR OTP 2123-0377, paragraph 133, where he explains that all Muslims were considered Seleka, and in his court testimony where he stated that everything seemed to show that there was a plan to liquidate the Muslims and this was a response to the violations committed by the Seleka. Of Mr. Mokom has spoken of these this morning himself. By the same token, ethnicities such as Gula, Runga, Yulu, Kara, Sara, Pearl and Hausa, associated with certain national origins like Chad or Sudan, were perceived as supportive of Seleka and therefore targeted by national or ethnic grounds. In so far, I refer you to CAR OTP 2088 2034, which is a speech of a leading anti Balaka member an interview given on 5th December. The anti-Balaka's attack on the Muslim civilians severely deprived them of fundamental rights, including the right to liberty, mental and bodily integrity, dignity, property, and religious freedom. My previous submissions under <coughs> counts two to four, counts five to seven, counts eight, also qualify as the underlying conduct for the war crime of directing attacks against the civilian population. Civilians not taking part in the hostilities were one of the objects of the attack. In addition to fighting the Seleka forces, the anti-Balaka also intended to target Muslim civilians in Bangui. They did not halt their attacks on these civilians after the Seleka had withdrawn. Witness P1528 stated that he learned after the 5 December attack that Christians had even been warned and placed palm leaves outside their homes to be spared by the anti-Balaka. I refer your honors to the statement and his trial testimony transcript at CAR OTP 2048-0757 at paragraph 33 and CAR OTP 
0000-1031, page 27 onwards. Most of the destroyed homes were not the homes of Seleka elements. That Muslim civilians were also the object of the attack is not only inferred from the criminal conduct and its effects. Rather, Your Honors, you will hear the voices of anti Balaka and their intention to attack Muslim civilians in Bangui when I cover the evidence in relation to the modes of liability. Let me now turn to Bosangoa. Mr. Mokam is charged with aiding and abetting, as well as otherwise contributing to the crimes of the anti-Balaka group in Bosangoa on 5 December, and the months afterwards until at least end of April 2014 here as well. Bosangoa lies to the north of Bangui in Wam province. In 2003, the population still included 8,000 Muslims. The evidence shows that the anti-Balaka groups were mostly comprised of the so-called Gobera group. Mr. Mokam had spoken of them himself this morning. This group attacked Basangoa around 14 hours on 5th December. Witnesses provide evidence that they were led by Florent Kema and Ndangba Pasidi during this attack. Prior to the attack, there had been a meeting of anti balaka groups in the geographical area between Bangui and Bosangoa, and during this meeting, it had been decided who would attack Bosangoa and who would turn to Bangui. This attack was planned to take place on the same day as the Bangui attack. Again during this attack and in its aftermath, the anti balaka turned their attention to targeting the Muslim population in Bosangoa. Florent Kema later told the UN panel of experts that in addition to getting rid of the Seleka, the main objective of his group was to chase out all the Muslims of Wam province where Bosangoa lies. The crimes against Muslims there show that this simplified message was taken on by anti balaka elements already during the attack. Your Honors, I will now turn to the charge of murder. In the course of the attack, the evidence demonstrates that at least 18 Muslim civilians were killed by anti balaka elements. These civilians were taking no active part in the hostilities. They were not armed. I refer your honors especially to the evidence of P2200. The prosecution has direct evidence of the killings by eyewitnesses as well as witnesses who saw the bodies of those killed. As provided by P2462, P2657, and P2453, the identified victims were not taking part in armed hostilities as they were killed, and that the perpetrators were indeed anti-Balaka elements is also based on their descriptions. On your screen, your honors, you have an image of these victims at a building which was called Maison de Kalingba, close to the place where the bodies would then be buried. One of the victims was Khadija Ajaro. She was part of a group of Muslim civilians who had stayed in the borough neighborhood of Basangoa and did not manage to flee. Khadija Ajaro was killed by bullet and her foot was ripped apart. Other dead bodies were found with hers. For further details, I refer you to the following references. Car OTP, 2088 to 173 and to 189, paragraphs 81 to 90, and CAR OTP to 1110415 at paragraph 67. 
Witness evidence in relation to these victims is supported by photographic imagery, for example, CAR OTP to 085-3982. Your Honors, in the course of this attack of the Bosangoa anti-Balaka group, at least two young Muslim women were raped by anti-Balaka elements, namely P2462 and P2657. Both women have provided their personal accounts, which is before you on the list of evidence. Both women were identifiable as Muslim on account of their clothing at the time. Both women suffer tremendously to this day from the effects of the rape. I will now turn to counts 14 and 15 attacks against buildings dedicated to religion, destruction of the adversary's property. Based on the accounts of several witnesses, such as P2200, P2049, P2133, P2453, and P2462, there are substantial grounds to believe that also hundreds of buildings of mostly residential nature were destroyed by anti-Balaka elements during and in the aftermath of the attack. The prosecution relies on the satellite imagery provided by UNISAT. This is at CAR OTP to 0790671, visible on the screen. According to UNISAT's analysis, 1,234 houses of a mostly residential nature and located in Muslim neighborhoods such as Boro were destroyed. In his trial testimony, in the case of Yekatomen and Gaisona, P2193 commented also on a photo provided by P1577 of a destroyed structure, and he testified that what he saw and the type of destruction was consistent with what he could detect on the satellite imagery. I refer you to CAR OTP 00001083 at pages 26 and 27. Your Honors, for the purpose of showing you the next video, I would like to request a short private session because it could otherwise be identifying and that footage had been shown in private session in Yekatoman and Gaisona. Mr. Court Officer, let kindly move into private session.
Good luck in open session, Mr. President. Please continue. Thank you. Thus, the evidence shows that the central mosque of Basangoa was reduced to ruins by anti-Balaka elements in the aftermath of the attack. Witnesses P2200, 2453, and 2462 provide evidence in relation of the timing of the destructure around 9th December 2013 by anti-Balaka elements. Your Honors, after the attack and in its course, Aided also by civilians, anti-Balaka elements pillaged Muslim houses and shops with the intent to take the property for private or personal use. This property was appropriated without genuine and valid consent. In relation to this count, I refer your honors to the evidence cited in the DCC Annex for this count and more specifically to the descriptions of P2049 and P2453. Furthermore, without grounds permitted under international law and by expulsion or other coercive effects, the anti-Balaka forced Muslim civilians in Bosangoa of all ages, including children and the elderly, to leave their homes and communities where they were lawfully present. This is captured under count 17 to 18. These civilians sought refuge at École de la Liberté. The prosecution has collected satellite imagery analyzed by UNISAT showing the sudden appearance of tent shelters at the school at the relevant time. Compare this image taken on 4th December 2013 on your screen with this image taken on 12th December 2013. It clearly reveals the development of the shelter. Again, the catalyst for this movement of people to this place was clear. The Muslims there fled there because the anti-Balaka had attacked their neighborhoods and destroyed their property and they feared for their lives. And the conditions at this school compound were horrible. The refugees had to be protected by soldiers. You can see these conditions in an excerpt of this video, which was broadcast on 17th December 2013. It is uh, in the English language. Meters from the Christian camp, 7,000 displaced Muslim refugees are living here in a camp set up on the site of a school. They have weapons. I've seen that for myself, she says. They came from the church and they broke everything. They stole everything. P0966 states that the anti-Balaka elements cleansed the houses in Bosangoa of Muslims so that Christians could go back to their lives. He states that they put women and children in the Liberté neighborhood of Bosangoa. The evidence as cited in our DCC annex shows that by the end of April 2014, Virtually the entire Muslim population remaining in Bosangoa had been evacuated, mainly to Chad, to prevent them from being killed. Muslim civilians of all ages were also deprived of their liberty. The anti-Balaka prevented them from leaving on threat of death while they were holed up at the Ecole de la Liberté. They had to be protected by international forces. P2657 recalled that these forces were protecting the refugees and that they were afraid to leave the refugees, I mean. It was like a prison, this witness says. Several witnesses also speak of a case concerning a man named Yaya Makonzi, who had been hacked to death after leaving the Ecole. 
The incident further entrenched their sense that they could not leave the enclave without risking death. The conduct described related to Bosangoa also meets the elements of persecution as charged under count 20. By targeting the Muslim civilian population of Bosangoa in these ways, on the basis of their real or perceived national, political, religious, or ethnic affiliation, the anti-Balaka acted with a persecutory intent. The previous submissions under counts 10 to 11, counts 14 to 16, counts 17 to 19, and count 20 also qualify as the underlying conduct for the war crime of directing attacks against the civilian population. And as stated above, the attack against these civilians was planned and it intentionally targeted Muslim civilians. Your Honors, the evidence demonstrates that the contextual elements of crimes against humanity and war crimes are also met. Based on our written submissions, the presentation of the evidence in the opening statement in relation to the pattern of criminality against Muslim civilians, as well as the presentation related to the charged crimes, there are substantial grounds to believe that these charged crimes were committed as part of a widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population. The attack was carried out pursuant to an anti-Balaka policy to target the Muslim civilian population in Western Kar because they were perceived as collectively respons responsible for the crimes committed by the Seleka or otherwise complicit with or supportive of the Seleka. The evidence further shows that the charged crimes were committed in the context of a protracted non-international armed conflict. Your Honors, I see the time is approaching one o'clock. I would now start on Mr. Mokom's responsibility. However, we could also do that after break. I'm in your hands. Yes. We will finish a bit later than one to make up for some of the lost All time. Right. So just please continue till uh, five past one more or less. Okay. Thank you. Mr. President, Your Honors, Mr. Mokom is charged under two alternative modes of liability, Article 25.3c and Article 25.3d. The evidence demonstrates that by mid-2013, key Bozizi allies, such as Patrice Edouard Ngaisona and Bernard Mokom, had designed a strategy to reclaim power in CAR and militarily oust the Seleka and its perceived supporters. The evidence also demonstrates that while implementing this strategy, the group of anti-Balaka who committed the crimes against Muslim civilians acted pursuant to a common purpose under 25.3d. And this purpose entailed targeting Muslim civilians, including by means of the charged crimes. And your honors, Mr. Mokom was no mere bystander or functionary. Rather, he was an important force within the anti-Balaka, who was both sophisticated and well-informed. Someone who, through his family connections, to President Bozizi and his past positions was involved in or at least highly aware of the ongoing armed conflict in CAR. Someone who was well connected due to his intelligence and police background and long-standing relationship with Bozizi and his inner circle. Someone who was well informed about CAR history and politics someone who knew that the anti-Balaka was largely comprised of ad hoc, ad hoc troops with minimal or no training, who had joined the fight because they were angry 
and had a serious axe to grind. We have heard him this morning. Someone who as anti-Balaka operations coordinator was in constant contact with high rank elements and troops on the ground and kept abreast of their operations before and after the 5 December attack. In these circumstances, as I will explain in more detail shortly, Mr. Mokham must have known, as any reasonable person in his situation would have known, that the large-scale attacks and subsequent operations in Basangoa and Bangui would foreseeably result in abuses, like the ones charged against the Muslim civilian population. The scale of the crimes, their temporal and geographical scope, their consistent pattern, same modus operandi, same type of perpetrator, same type of victim, show that the anti balaka perpetrators of the charged crimes did not act independently from one another, but as a group of persons acting in concert. P0287, who was a close observer of the situation, understood that the objective of the anti balaka generally was to chase out the Seleka. But because they made an association between Seleka, Sudanese, Chadians, foreigners, they would group them all together as their enemy. In the lower ranks, explains the witness, the perceived enemy simply became Muslims in general. That the anti balaka groups who were committing the crimes had in common a purpose is further shown by the anti-Muslim sentiments expressed by rank and file, but also high rank anti balakas who were close to Mr. Mokom. This next short video is from Bosangoa in October 2013. In it, an anti balaka element describes how the Seleka killed and decapitated his brother. Then another anti balaka explains they kill Muslim civilians because, and I quote, they do the same to us. And you can watch this video now. Les Seleka ont pris une épée, ils lui ont crevé les yeux, ils l'ont décapité. The Seleka took a spear, they pulled out his ears, there was a spear, and I was fleeing. When they left the village, I came back, I took a piece of cloth, I picked up my the pieces of my brother's body and I put them in a hole. These are young people who are burning with vengeance, endless vengeance. And they are taking it out on civilian rebels who are uh, now being killed in the bushes because they are just like them. What they do to us will do to them. Excerpt, which is from CAR OTP 2065-3188 taken on 10th December 2013 in an anti balaka camp in Boeing neighborhood, you will hear an anti balaka element showing a tear gas gun. He explains that they use it to drive Muslims from their homes so they can kill them all, including the children. Well, we have to lodge this towards the Muslims who are in their homes so that they may come out. Uh, once we smoke them out and then we kill them. Uh, we kill them, even little children, we kill them. The next slide is an excerpt video taken from a recorded interview dated 13th of December 2013 in which your honors can hear and see Silvestre Yaguzu, an anti palaka spokesperson. Yaguzu, who also took part in the 5 December attack, was a close associate of Mr. Mokham. And there is evidence that he later became his deputy when the national coordination was founded. Hear his own words in the following video. Notre message. Our message. 
We, the anti-Balaka, I am the, their spokesperson, and this is what I have to say. I call on that so-called infamous president, Dotoja, to resign. He must resign. I give him 24 hours. 24 hours, I say it again, 24 hours. He must resign in order to save. Well, if he is conscious and wise and resigns, it would mean that he would have saved Muslim Central Africans. But if the contrary happens and he doesn't resign, then we will carry out a massacre, and that is very clear. Show that the anti balaka group shared the common purpose to target the Muslim civilians a purpose that was rooted in vengeance and hatred on account of unspeakable atrocities the Seleka perpetrated largely, if not only, against non-Muslim civilians. But Tukvokva is not a defense in law. It explains the anti balakas rationalization of their own conduct. If I have a little bit more time before the break, I will go into Mokom's, Mr. Mokom's contributions now. Yes? Five minutes? Five minutes, yes. All right. Your Honors, Mr. Mokom, on the basis of the evidence before you, contributed in at least four ways to the charged crimes. Firstly, by helping organize and structure the anti balaka right from its earliest days, especially by supporting the Gobera group, and then later on in his role as official coordinator in Bangui. Secondly, by providing material support, in particular ammunition. Thirdly, by helping coordinate the movement of fighters and in the design of the attacks themselves. Fourthly, by providing advice, instructions, moral support, and encouragement to anti balaka fighters on the ground, both before and after the charged attacks and within the charged period. Given that these contributions overlap factually, I will address them jointly, but chronologically, distinguishing two periods. First, I will address the period when Mr. Mokom was still in exile in Zongo. And then second, I will address the period with a particular focus on after he had relocated to Bangui. Let's first turn to Mr. Mokom's contributions while he was still residing in Zongo, in particularly his contributions to the 5 December attacks on Bangui and Bosangoa. Mr. Mokom's contributions to the overall development of the anti balaka are important as they improved the capability of the anti balaka as a fighting force and thereby made it more possible for the charged crimes to eventually occur. The prosecution can rely on at least 12 insiders who show that Mr. Mokom was a person of influence within the groups. He liaised with key anti balaka figures, both those on the ground in Kar and leadership figures in exile in Cameroon, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and other places, meaning that he spoke with them, he strategized with them, and he supported the movement as a whole from Zongo. The witnesses I refer to are in particular P0446, P0884, P0889, P0966, P1172, P1339, P1521, P1719, P1847, 
P2232, P2269, and P2328. Multiple of these insiders also report that Mr. Mokom helped arrange ammunition and weapons for the anti-Balaka in advance of the 5 December attacks. And to deal with this issue, I would request a private session, but maybe we do that after the break. Yes, we can uh, uh, pause here. You have more, roughly had already one hour. Um, before I join the hearing, uh, mm, uh, you will need to specify the, the ERNs of item of evidence you have referred to earlier. You, you kindly do this at the beginning of next session, and from then on, just refer to the numbers any time you, uh, you present an item of evidence uh, for the records and for the transcripts. So now I will adjourn the hearing for 90 minutes, so we will uh, uh, start again at uh, uh, 1435. Thank you very much. All right, we will be.